You're listening to another episode of Battles of Bits of Rubber. You know, the podcast about making prosthetics. Uh, let's talk about the craft and stuff or whatever uh, whatever I'm going to be talking about. Oh, jeez. <laughs> So what else have I been doing? So I've been playing with my camera. I went for a massive walk this morning. I was listening to the Dave Goggins audio book. Can't hurt me. It's a good book. He's a he's a badass. He really is a fucking badass. He's amazing. Now you I told me about him, him on, ages ago. I follow ago. him on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I follow. I started following him today on Instagram, and I noticed that uh, you'd liked him as well. I was like, oh yeah, and I remember that you told me about him ages ago. I'm sure yeah, you did. He's, he's a He's a madman. So if you've not heard of this, it's a, it's a guy called Dave Goggins. He was a Navy SEAL, but he's just had the most incredible life. And he's like 43, 44 now. So he's not yeah, that no, old. He's, he's, but, been in, um, he's been in three, three of the four ma- major branches of the service. Uh, he was an Army Ranger. He was in the Air Force. He was a SEAL. Mm-hmm. And he's just a tough mamma jamma. Yeah, and does like ultra marathon. Ultra marathons, yeah. <laughs> run like a hundred miles. He did once did a two hundred and five mile run, like yeah, nonstop. He, he did a <laughs> he did a thing out here in Colorado um, last year before all this bullshit that's going on now, um, and he actually had to be taken to the ER for altitude uh, stuff. I don't know, was up over Loveland Pass or he was just not used to the elevation but mm. he said fuck this I'm getting hit. and he went back out and finished the race <laughs> yeah it's just, it's, he just keeps going just tape himself back together and keep going but it's inspiring so I'm listening to this one I'm walking thinking oh I'm doing my 10 mile walk you know and it's like you fucking nothing <laughs> mate <laughs> yeah do it do it carrying a huge carrying a telephone pole yeah oh my god yeah it's quite impressive anyway so that was my morning and then yeah uh, bits and bobs um and stuff and i've been editing uh, a couple of the podcasts and uh yeah we're here to talk about about bubbles today air bubbles and what a pain in the ass they are <laughs> <laughs> well i just figured uh let me try that again i just figured <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> air bubbles <laughs> yes and what a pain in the ass uh, they are the bane of a mold maker's existence yeah, it's pretty uh, because I saw some uh, on, on a couple of forums. Uh, a few people were posting about air bubbles, and I think it was somebody was casting a silicon hand out of an alginate mold, and they had big bubbles on it. And somebody mentioned, "Oh, the the bubbles are um, on the alginate," and I was like, "Yeah, but if they were in the alginate, then they would be raised on the silicone, and they weren't. They were indented in the silicone. So, hmm. uh, so it was it was the, it was a different kind of air bubble. So it kind of got me thinking about all the different kinds of air bubbles and where." air pockets and things can come into play and i thought it would be a worthy uh, point of discussion with regards to yeah. air, air air pockets are something you really have have to take into account too there is as monstrous as undercuts mm-hmm. because because basically they are i don't know would you call them call an air pocket a a, a reverse undercut it's, it's something you need to take some, something you need to take into account when you're creating the mold. So if you're if you're doing a hand and the fingers wind up pointing up, because mm-hmm. they curl around, that's gonna and and you haven't allowed for any kind of a air vent yeah. from the from the fingertips, you're gonna wind up without being able to cast those fingertips because of that air pocket. Yeah. Well, because there's different kinds of reasons why you might get air bubbles. I mean, like if you're, if you're certainly, if you're like, like you're saying there, if you're filling it as a pore, then you're reliant on, on gravity doing all the work. And then like you say, you, you trap air in the, in the fingertips, but also. Yeah. Rotocasting can, can help. Yeah. Help alleviate that. Yeah. So if you can swill something like that. But that great. doesn't, that won't help with air bubbles. In fact, potentially rotocasting can create air bubbles because it's you're agitating the material you're putting in the mold so the very the very act of mixing whatever you're going to be putting into the mold is creating air bubbles yeah and unless you vac it out of there yeah 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you can get air bubbles in the material through how you mix it. Like if you've got a two-part material, you know, you have to put two things together and then mix them. And then that stirring action actually adds air bubbles, as is the yeah, case Even with if silicone. you're really careful with it, if you're just barely stirring it so that you're, you're purposely trying not to create more air bubbles, mm. you can't not put air bubbles into it. Yeah, it's just whether or not they're going yeah. to be a problem, depending on how you're going to use it and i guess you can de you know degas it you put it in a vacuum tank and suck all that air if you have a gas you know and a vacuum chamber but not everybody does um no nope. but uh, it's it's definitely worth thinking about um but yeah so a lot of materials now are thin enough that any any chance of getting air bubbles against the surface are are mitigated because it's got a long working time and they'll just rise of their own accord it's okay if you get some air bubbles in the body of of the material mm. but you just don't want any any air bubbles on the surface yeah because they're a pain that's where the trouble starts yeah yeah definitely and air bubbles in a mold i guess are, are more of a problem because then every cast that comes out of them will bear the fruits of those air bubbles whereas a cast is just you know you could cast another one out of a good mold but air bubbles yeah are, you can waste a lot of time having to p patch a gajillion air bubbles yeah every time so yeah well let's have a quick uh, go through some some of the different things like uh we've done like a little i'll put this together for the for the the show notes but um different sort of uh, like a mind map it's my favorite thing in the world is a mind map just to kind of uh push ideas around and see what's what things like materials and stuff i mean i think with with live casting that's normally the first sort of material that you might use where air bubbles might start robbing you of your details and stuff obviously mm -hmm. in those cases you mix up your alginate and the air bubbles that you're going to get they tend to be where the alginate wasn't or, or even silicone whatever it is but it's 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 the air bubbles are typically present because it wasn't pushed into the deep areas of the face sufficiently so it's right. corners of the mouth corners of the nose corners of the eyes mm -hmm. eyebrows often and eyes i think quite often you get air bubbles around there because people are yeah, reluctant right, to press hard. right in the corner right in the corner and lashes the, where your tear ducts are yep eyebrows will um grab air and kind of create a, a pocket yeah so it's good good to really kind of dig in there and push it a lot of people are reluctant to push hard and i mean you don't have to like take a run up and stab someone in the eye with your thumb but like when you're tired you know you'll rub your eyeball with a with a closed eye, obviously, but you'll rub your eye quite quite hard with the heel of your hand, so you can to, afford to, to the push point in. of seeing spots. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know you can afford to push reasonably firmly to to, to wipe. It's a wiping action to to, to make sure you, you get into those deep areas. I mean, you life cast a lot. Yeah, you always you know spread it on. You don't don't just push it on because you're creating air pockets by the very act of not yeah. spreading I've seen it. people do it and a lot of it, it, it often happens a lot when people sort of you know they're live casting the first few times there's a lot of sort of tapping action rather than smearing it should be wiping rather than tapping mm -hmm. you don't want to put your hand on and then pull it straight off so you leave meringue peaks you want to smear men smear you remember that from <laughs> smear it up smear it on um, Nathan Lane in, uh, oh, what was it, the birdcage, when he's trying to train Robin Williams to, to be more masculine, <laughs> you know, trying to be more alpha male. He goes, men smear, and he's smearing like peanut butter on the bread. <laughs> men smear. Um, so, yeah, you want to you smear that on. So that's, that's the first uh, point of, you know, where you could fuck it up with air bubbles. And then when you put your, your plaster in that life cast, then you might get air bubbles from the mix. It might be on the surface. Again, from not, not touching sufficiently. Mm -hmm. I tend to brush in the first layer or use a hand and smear. I don't know if you do that. To chase out air bubbles. Yeah, I do too. And I also I also will agitate it to release any air bubbles that are against the surface to make them make them rise to the top. Something you can also do before you put put your stuff into the mold is you can spray in a light misting of what I call wet water, something from, from my model railroading uh, scenery building days. It it's a uh, it's it's water. I like mm -hmm. to use distilled water, but maybe just a drop of dish right. soap in it. So to and what that'll do is that will release help release surface tension which can latch on to air bubbles okay so let's just explain uh, what the surface is so that would be like tiny little air bubbles that get trapped when the when the plaster rolls over the the mold surface you might get tiny little air bubbles that trap yeah you'll notice that when you when you pour 
pour something into a cup and you around the edges of the cup, the material is kind of curved mm -hmm. upward on the perimeter. That's caused right. by surface tension. So that's a good uh, that's a good tip for for, for getting because obviously at the, the very beginning of the process you want to really get it as good as you can because you're whatever you 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 I mean mm -hmm. a lot of air bubbles are not a big deal you can kind of fill them but anything that means you're you know you lose details that's at the very start of the process you inherit those further down the line so you know the the, the less problems you have earlier on the better so you've got that and then resin you can often get air bubbles in like I guess with fast setting fast cast because a lot of people like a urethane resin because it's quick but the danger yeah. is obviously if you dump it into a big mold it might start to get hot and, and thicken before you get a chance to touch that surface so i I, th I personally am a fan of a slow if you're going to do like a block mold like a solid mold in urethane I'm, I'm a fan of a slower setting resin like f40 i think f40 is the one the blue mm -hmm. one i think from axon i think it is um that's a nice slower setting you're like you've got a good two or three minutes of mixing and a good five, six minutes of working time before it starts to thicken. Yeah, that's like the smooth the smooth cast three oh five I think has a, okay. a seven minute and that gives you working nice time. time and and then yeah, maybe a, a ten or fifteen minute set time. So you got you got lots of time to brush it in there and take care of it. Something else you can do though is uh if when you're casting uh, resin in a mold is you can pressure cast it. Now I don't know anything about pressure casting because I've never done it. So something that you can do do a lot with uh, with dental casts. You can you can actually put the dent the the dental acrylic in the mold and put it in in warm water and pressure cast it. It'll it'll set a lot faster and light pressure will crush any air bubbles that are in there. Like maybe. 10, 15 pounds. If you go much more than that, if you go 25, 30 or, or above, uh, you're going to actually push the resin into little invisible micro pores in the silicone mold that when you demold it, you're going to have all these little raised protrusions that makes it feel kind of like, like gr right. gritty sandpaper. And so too much pressure is a bad thing. But a little bit of pressure, and it doesn't take that much to pop those yeah. air bubbles. I guess so. So that would be like the reverse of a, a vacuum chamber. So it's actually adding pressure to, to force down the yeah. air. Yeah, and I I actually use the use the same chamber. I've got a I've got different separate lids uh, for the vacuum because vacuum you don't need to clamp the lid down. It'll the the vacuum will just suck the lid right down onto the to the chamber or the pressure pot you need to be able to latch it down tightly because if it's not latched down and you put too much pressure on it, you run the risk of it just blowing off, which would be a bad thing. <laughs> We're back to the pain in the ass of the bubbles, aren't we? Yeah, no, that would be uh, that that, that yeah. would be like a like yeah, like a bomb going off. It'd be horrific. Um Okay, yep. so you got the pressure thing. And then one thing I think that's worth noting is like you could degas your material um, before, but that won't necessarily stop the surface air bubbles because those are air bubbles that aren't necessarily in the material so much as those are surface bubbles can Correct. be. Because bubbles tend to rise, right, away from the surface, especially if the, if the, if the material is yeah. liquid enough mm -hmm. at that time. So a lot of it, you could degas it. You could spend precious time degassing something, dump it into a mold badly and... And still and put, then put yeah, air bubbles back yeah, in because by you've actually it got the, the air bubbles are not in the material. They were trapped as the material went over the surface. So, so there's still something to be said for not degassing it. If you've got a short amount of time, you know, a short window of time, don't degas it. Instead, just work the surface really well, and then you know, pound that in, um, and with a brush or, or with a gloved hand. Actually, I mean, what's good about brushes is yeah. obviously they're they're very soft. But the other thing that can be a pain with that is that you end up losing hairs from the you know the brush was in there and you won't necessarily notice until you Lose. pull the thing out and see a bloody black paintbrush you know. losing hairs and transferring air from with between the brush yeah. the bristles yeah into the material yeah, it's, uh, it's fraught with danger putting the wind up everyone with this stuff but it's, it's just something to be aware of <laughs> uh, and viscosity i think is an interesting material as well because it's one of those things with silicones i've noticed like uh gel Double zero. I've got some double zero that's probably about five or six years old, and I opened up this tub and I looked in there, and it was—it's like treacle. I mean, you can scoop it up, and it just 
it, it'll probably make great sculpture actually but um i can't i can't put it into a mold <laughs> and i think you know materials that are have a lower viscosity are preferable in a way because they're quicker to mix they're quicker to degas as well but sure. also you just typically trap less air have you ever tried to um degas a gypsum yes it took a long time and it covered the the inside of because it's yeah. so it's so thick it's yeah you can get some of the air out but you can't get it all out and i've also degas there are some silicones we should probably just have a, a, a very brief mention about um viscosity measurement how exciting is that? Um, when you measure, when you me if you look at any um, material that you have, you should be able to get an MSDS um, sort of, you know, material safety data sheet that explains what to do if you spill it or drink it or push it up your nose or whatever. Um, and there's there's normally like a, you know the material um, properties, the material properties, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to find, and then um, you know it'll tell you the color and you know what the the flash point will be all the, all the important stuff like that and the other thing i'll tell you is um it's viscosity which we measured in center points a little c and a big p and basically the higher the number the thicker it is and um i think water has a center point of between like one and five that's very very runny and i think i don't know what mm. peanut butter is peanut butter is about a hundred thousand center points something like that i don't know i'll have to do a little chart to be sure but i know gel 25 platinum gel 25 is about 3000 centipoise and i think gel 10 is more like 6000 so it's almost twice as thick it's still quite runny but it's not that thick and obviously you can imagine something that's runnier to it uh, something that's runny uh, is much quicker to degas because it, the bubbles can come out willingly sure. because there's less resistance for the bubbles yeah and depending on where you are you too you also have so many uh, inches of mercury how you how you measure measure the vacuum strength at my elevation you know i'm i'm uh where where my shop is i'm a little little higher than the mile high city so i'm i'm about i was going to wonder yeah do you think 5800 feet effect. above sea level and and it and it and at my elevation you know, you, you want to try to pull 30 inches of mercury when you're degassing silicone or resin or whatever you're, whatever you're degassing. At, at my elevation, I can only get about 28. That's, yeah. that's, that's max, which is usually plenty. You know, you just want to make sure you've got a long working time and a, and a big enough container to degas in yeah. so it doesn't come frothing out over the top of your container because it'll, it'll, it'll increase in volume probably four or five times what. Yeah, it kind of creeps up and then sort of breaks, doesn't it, and then bubbles down. It looks like it's boiling. Yeah. So you just have to be able to have to leave it in there and let it, let it degas for a while, you know, just. No. 30 seconds probably isn't going to isn't going to do it but if you you know 5 minutes should should be sufficient for for most most things but if you've got a 6 minute yeah. working time and you're degassing it for 5 minutes that doesn't that doesn't give you much of a window to finish the operation yeah. you started before your material goes off yeah, on you. Yeah, good. Very expensive you mistake. Got a bucket full of solid it. stuff. <laughs> I mean, it could looks it looks cool when it sets mid degassing yeah. as well. I can't think of anybody that had that probably hasn't happened to it at some point in the in the evolution of their career. Yeah, and you've got to do a few things like you've got to rehearse getting that thing in and the lid on. You've got to make sure before you start that the container is one that will fit in the degasser because that's a bad mistake. Uh, but it, but it's also for me like my my degasser mm -hmm. it probably takes about yeah. I'd say about a minute to get up to full pressure. So there's a minute of getting to that point before it starts pulling the air out. Then it degasses maybe three four minutes. Mm -hmm. Then it takes probably yeah. another thirty seconds to let the air back in, and then you've got to carefully release the lid put it down somewhere so you're looking at an extra minute's worth of work that's not even degassing just to be yeah. able to gas you've got to account for that which again if you've only got a five minute window is a big consideration and the temperature if you're doing this somewhere, somewhere where it's very warm obviously you need to retard the silicon and we had this on dracula we had to basically put we yeah. retarded the silicone and kept the components in the fridge overnight before we did a pour and we just had enough time it was crazy so you know it can be scary because uh, it was hot. Something you can do too, if it's 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 not a big expense, but it's an added expense to to an already expensive proposition, is um, I have a, a photo, you know, a dark room timer that you can set a timer if you if you're working by yourself. Uh, it's a good idea to have have something that will let you know when you have to have to get to the next step. So yeah, maybe have a little timer on your phone and just. 
Yeah, the phones phones have got timers. Yeah, make a point. Again, it'll be on the MSDS sheets. Or do a little test and try it. Do a little test. I think that's very important to do tests uh, with small amounts and test these things. If, if it's absolutely critical, if you like you say, if you've got things like altitude is going to affect how quickly you can degas or you're somewhere where it's very hot or your material has been kept somewhere. Cold. All of these things you won't know until... Humidity is going to be a factor as well. Yeah, you can't just go by what the what the sheet says because it might be actually in this particular circumstance slightly different. So it's worth doing a small test, especially if you're going to use a lot of material on a big mold. Just do a small amount and just time it and see so you can be sure how that batch sets because that's scary. Um, so yeah, you've got your uh, your materials. Then things like application technique, like we mentioned briefly, you know, you could brush something on or you could swill it or you could work it in with your hand. The other thing you could do is some materials is actually spray them on. I mean, we do that with cat mm -hmm. plastic obviously but i've seen on big molds you can you can get silicones you can spray it's not practical for most people because uh, you need to dedicate space to be able to do something like that uh, you do not want to do that in your kitchen <laughs> yeah it's it's a no that's a that's a big yeah. undertaking i've to, seen demos with that to spray silicone they do that's that's mostly with you know big stuff you know they do that with with automotive mold mold making and mm. and so on right there They'll even have vacuum bags and for big stuff, but that's but, that's mostly yeah. for really big stuff. It's it's overkill for something like a nose. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think careful pouring and brushing is good, but that's what's nice, I guess, about a clear silicone is that you can actually kind of see through it. You can see whether you've got air bubbles uh, in there, which is good. Um, it's probably also worth mentioning mm -hmm. uh, the other mm -hmm. issues like open mold or closed molds. Like if you're doing a flat mold, you can kind of see assuming you've taken care of your you know your edge and everything it should be fine um i mean the silicon i use for a lot of flat molds i tend to use quite a hard silicone like a 38 i thought 30, 33 sure it's quite runny you know and you know so that's so you i, I pour a little bit make sure it's in the details yeah. especially if i've got five or six molds i'll pour a little bit into each one so that the, the bubbles that were on the surface have a chance to rise before putting the rest of it in. So the air bubble doesn't have to travel through an inch of silicone. Do you know what I mean? If you just put a little bit in and blow it, use um, I usually use a, like an yeah. airbrush with just air. I just I don't have a, a an air gun. You you can get those attachments that are just a trigger. Yeah, well if if you yeah if you mm -hmm. if you use one of those compressed air cans, you know, like the dust off. Uh, that's yes. you got to be real careful using something like that. So an airbrush, you can control lower air pressure much easier than with one of those cans, because if you're not careful, you're gonna fire that yeah. air into the yeah. into or worse, the silicone and it's gonna it go just... all over the place. <laughs> that's a disappointing afternoon. Oh my god! Hey, I did something. We had this job on uh, just before Christmas. Yeah, I had to make a bunch of these um, yeah. pieces and had two people working there with me and we had a, a real rush job to get this done and uh so we'd sculpted these molds uh so sculpted these pieces and made molds i think it was like four or five different age pieces all set up and so we made these big flat molds of all of the pieces so yeah the two cheeks and the forehead and the chin and something else all as flat pieces it was really really like I had a week to do the whole thing like five full age makeups it's crazy um so i was really proud of myself that we made a you know a single mold of all these pieces in and then um I thought, oh, what we'll do is we'll just mold them. So I, you know, got boards and made walls around it, put the flat mold in. And then I fuck it. I'd done this before and I can't remember. I'd for, I can't believe I'd forgotten and didn't remember to, to not do this again. So I filled up every one of these molds with plaster to make a master mold. Of course, the fucking silicone floated, didn't it? So every one of these molds just floated. So I had to just rip it out and then just start all over yep. again. It was really <laughs> The silicone was fine, oh, but it, man. it cost about three quarters of a day because of you know the mess and the, it was just a real pain but uh yeah so if you get a mold silicone in plaster yeah uh, i've 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 done i've done that with um yeah. where i've been molding some 3d printed stuff and i've and i've put like a, a little dot of hot glue on the on the back of it and put it down on a board <laughs> But the board's really shiny. It's not a right. sealed edge around the the piece. And I'll pour, pour the silicone onto into the into the form over the model. Floating around. And I'll come back in 15 minutes later, and the fucking 3D printed piece is floating on top of the silicone. I said, "Son of a bitch!" <laughs> and there's no. And there's at that point there's. No, nothing you can do about it because the only way to the only way to get it back to the bottom 
of the yeah. of the the area is to put a weight on it. So you have and to, you have to just peel it out, mold, let it dry, like, let it set up, peel bitch. it off, do it again. And, oh, that's that is so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> fucking and thing. And you're all excited. Start you all over again. Feel. Well, guess what the other 90% is? It's fucking air. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a lesson learned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so just print your pieces solid. <laughs> Sure, it'll cost. It'll take or, eighty-five or hours. Or super to glue it to the board, <laughs> and probably warp. Oh my gosh! <clears throat> oh yeah, no, I think there's still mm. profanity floating oh, in space funny. above. The um, shop. Yeah, so if you have an open mold, uh, you know, typically with regards to air, except for me, th- yeah, the reason it floated obviously because I didn't de gas the silicon I poured, and it ended up having tiny little air bubbles in it, and so it was lighter than the plaster. Fucking thing. Anyway, I learned my lesson again. Which means I didn't really learn it at all. Um, but yeah, if you've got an open mold, like we, we mentioned this before, I think like I, I will often spray the back with like a silicon oil or something just to help any any remaining, again, I guess, to break that surface tension on the back. But if I've degassed it, it should be fine. Yeah. Um, and that's why I like a, lot, a nice slow silicone, like 7315 mm-hmm. is quite nice. It has a good couple of hours before it sets up. Or um, uh, there's one by Zermac, HT33 over here, and it's like a 33 sure silicone, and it takes about five or six hours to cure. So when it's cool, it's really nice because you've got plenty of You probably don't even need to degas it, to be honest. You just leave it. It's lovely. Plenty of time. I use um, mm. I use Mold Star 30, which is kind of almost a, a navy blue silicone. It's a 30, sh- 30 sure, and you've got about a 30-minute working time with it and then a, a four hour cure and okay. you it's it's uh thin enough it's uh that you don't need to degas it i mean yeah. you can but but it's thin enough and you've got a, it's got a long enough working time that you don't have to degas it but it's the mold star 30 that i've noticed uh has the micro pores in it when, when i have done dental casts and i've used too much air pressure it's that's oh, when I've noticed the resin okay. pushing its way into micropores in the silicone. So maybe I will degas before I do another dental mold, if I remember. But again, you know, you don't need to use much pressure. And, and you know, I've, I've done stuff where I've, you know, you think, well, if, <laughs> if 15 pounds is good, yeah, 40 pounds ought Turns to be better. <laughs> Because it's, it's just yeah. that much more. Terrifying. And no, it's that's gonna that's gonna fuck it up. Oh well, and yeah, and, and there's not much you can do about that. I mean, you could sand it back, I guess, but what if you get on the inside of your mold as well? So oh, you know, so yeah, so do, do it. Just think, think first. And then uh, the other thing is obviously uh, the more common, I guess, is the closed mold. And I think this is where a lot of people go wrong is if you've got a you know a piece that. You, Obviously, you've got to close your mold up and then you're going to either inject it or it's not so much a problem if you've got a flood, you know, like if you've got a, a t- you know, a closed mold, which is basically you've got your core and you've got a mold. And depending on how you close it is going to make a difference. Like I'm a, I'm a big fan of mold, making molds like bowls, basically, which often means the mold ends up being a yeah. bigger mold than it needs to be. So it uses more material. But mm-hmm. when I turn that mold over... It's basically like a bowl, like a cereal bowl. So you can put the silicone in it and you don't have to worry about it leaking out anywhere. And then you basically squeeze in your core. Mm -hmm. It displaces and pushes that excess silicone up. And then you know pretty much that you've got everywhere with it. And so long as that mold is clamped or strapped down well, it should at least fill well. You know, you don't know how your edges are going to be till you get it out. But what you can also do, yeah, what you can also do is. Put some material on. on the core before you put it into the negative to make sure that you to make sure that you've got good surface coverage on the core, and then carefully squash it in so you're not trapping inadvertently yeah. trapping air bubbles, which you may get around the the lip the rim of of the of the mold. Yeah. It's something that you just have to. There's there's no way to hundred percent prevent that. You just have to be careful, and if you think that it might be a potential problem where air might get trapped and an edge where you don't want air bubbles at the edge because then that's something when you go to apply the the prosthetic 
is going to create a problem that you're going to have to, to fix um, is maybe some small vents. You know, there have been some times when I've taken a, a Dremel tool with one of the, the little cutoff wheels and cut a really tiny channel, even even a, an X-Acto knife and just scratching a tiny, tiny channel, something that will give a little room. Because air doesn't need, it's like, it's like, like water, you know, rising to its own level. If there is, or silicone getting through a hairline crack, a hairline thickness may be all the vent size you need to untrap air bubbles, scratching into the negative. Right. So you're talking about scratching... You're talking about actually scratching over the cutting edge. Yeah, over the cutting edge, either on the either on the core or on the on the negative at at the highest point in the mold, because air is air is always going to try to get to the highest point. Yes, that's a really good point. And then that way you don't you 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 may have a little thing you got to snip off on your edge, but that's preferable to having yeah. to fill a much bigger air bubble. Absolutely, yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I have in the past done things where I've drilled through the core. Or if I really have to, I'll drill through the mold, which means I'll get like a tiny little, mm -hmm. you know, nib on the actual piece, which again you can snip off, but it's not on the very edge. Yeah, anymore. it's like a six a sixteenth of an inch, you know, it's like, you know, a half half a millimeter or something. That's that's easy to to, to, fill, to deal yeah. with. I'll tell you something I've uh, done in the past, and I've I've had to use my Dremel for this. Is instead of using a drill bit, I might use a drill bit for the very, very first bit, but often drill bits break and they're not very flexible. And sometimes you mm -hmm. don't have good access to where you need to drill. And you have to drill from the inside because you can't be sure if you drill from the outside that you're going to arrive at the right point. Uh, is to use a. Oh, and yeah, drilling, drilling from the outside in, you run the risk of when the, when the bit comes through the other side. Mm may take a chunk may take a chunk of detail with yeah, it. Yeah, we'll chip that gel coat or something, you're right. That, yeah, that so, would definitely so it's happen. so it's better to go from the, go from the inside, from the inside yeah. out. But instead of using a drill bit, even a good drill bit, I, I will use a, a piece of piano wire and just cut the the, oh. the front off. Because you can get a you know a good six, seven inches piece of piano wire. You will need the, the smaller yeah. chuck that you'll get in a Dremel unless you've got an adapt you know, a small chuck adapter for your big drill. But it makes it and don't don't have it too fast because obviously the long piece of wire will kind of kick out and spin you know it'll <laughs> exactly yeah. take your eye out so be careful and wear appropriate um, personal protection equipment when doing this um but yeah um it, it works great for drilling holes it won't last forever you can just dremel the the, the tip or use a you know a pair of side cutters to i'll have to try it, that it, that's a that's a great it works idea. really well and you can bend round corners and because the piano wire can bend you know, it it doesn't snap, um, and if the piano wire does, yeah. Well, up, most of the drill bits that I would be using, that, you know, are you know, those sixteenth of an inch yeah. drill bits, the, the smallest ones you get. They're only about two and a half inches long, and sometimes you need to be going through four inches of, you know, because because of the angle, you're going to have to. The mold may only be an inch inch and a half thick, but yeah. you need to get through four inches of of angle tricky to reach the outside and it's interesting because yeah. we used a lot of uh, fiberglass molds you know the mold was only about you know three mil thick so it was fine and you could actually yeah. see through it um but uh with uh you know epoxy doughs and stuff now everything tends to be at least you know an inch thick or so and um yeah. and depending on where it is and let's just assume it's going to be in a really shitty thick part of the mold because <laughs> that's just how life works <laughs> of course um then it'll end up being you know that you'll you may have to drill through like two inches of something made of epoxy, which is like oh, you know. So yeah, try the uh, try the piano wire thing because um, that can work. I have done it in the past. I might see if I can stick some pictures on the blog post where, when I'm molding something, if I know it's likely to be a high, a problem for air bubbles, before I start molding it, I will stick a piece of piano wire in the high points as risers and then make the mold around that. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's a flood mold yep. or something. And we did this for you, for the ears. That you had sculpted for yep. um, for the magazine. Yeah, I think we used uh, I think we used some piano wire for that. Yeah, and you just stick it in the high point, and it just you make your mold around it, and then when you pull when you finish with your mold, you remove the piano wire, and you end up with a little hole, and it just cuts out that whole inconvenience of drilling, and also the surround of where the piano wire was has gel coat on it, so it's got a nice finish, which means when you're pulling your casts out, it should be nice and clean every time. Because obviously when you drill through a material, you expose end fibers of things like, you know, mm -hmm. um, epoxy fibers and all that kind of shit. And it just becomes a bit... Fuck, this is really nerdy and deep shit, but this is... <laughs> 
this is what keeps me awake at night. No, but it's 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 important stuff. Yeah. Well, it's the subject of the podcast. So if, yeah, if you don't like that, you're listening to the wrong <laughs> fucking podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but closed molds can be a pain in the ass. And the other thing that can happen with a closed mold, if you haven't done a bowl shape, I'll have to put some photos. Fo- some pictures of different moles so i can explain what i mean but basically if you've got like cheeks that come up you know close to the ear then when you put that mold on the bench the cheeks are then the highest point because they're sticking up high yes and that's and that's where you run the risk of getting, getting air bubbles getting nasty air bubbles especially if you some place where you don't want them especially if you've economized in the mold making so you've got a it's not a bowl. Like the, when you look at it on the bench, the chin is lower than the highest point of the cheeks. So when you fill it with silicone, it's mm. just pissing out those low points. You can't get it up to the highest point of the cheek. So that's why. And if it's a big mold, it's not worth doing it. In which case, you'd probably do a mold where you close it first. You bolt it together or clamp it together first and then fill it. But that's not, you're not out of the woods then because you might trap an air bubble. And again, you won't know until you open it up that there's an air bubble and then all you can do really is make a point a note of where the air bubble is try and keep it on the core yeah. and then mark it on the core and then drill through the core whilst the piece is in position so that's why it's so critically important to look at the negative to see where potential problem points could be it's just like before you mold your sculpture make sure you've taken into account every potential undercut yeah because if you're doing rigid to rigid you know half a millimeter is enough to permanently lock up a mold yeah it's a terrifying prospect isn't it so you end up sort of you know perhaps doing more work making it in multiple pieces or using a silicone it'll cost you in money or time to avoid those uh undercuts but and time is time is preferable to money yes if there is time (laughs) Uh, that's horrible if If you've got neither of those you have to ask yourself why you're doing the job (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is something I often end up finding myself doing. Um, and then you then you look to see if Walmart's hired. Yeah. Well, I will say that you need to, um, yeah, I, I need to I need to put some pictures to explain what this means with the open and closed mold. But basically just think about, the, the thing to remember with pouring molds is they're, they're fluids. So fluids will always find a level. So if level means, you know, the lowest point is much lower than the highest point and the silicon can get out, then it will run out the mold and you'll end up possibly um, not having, you know, silicon in those high points. You'll end up, they're not so much air bubbles. It's just the silicon didn't make it that far or worse still, it did make it, but then it leaked out from somewhere else and then dropped. So Mm -hmm. you end up with an air bubble, which is a pain. Um, But uh, I'll put some pictures of that mold. An incomplete prosthetic. Yes, it's rather inconvenient. Uh, So you've got that. And then um, uh, one thing we were, saying earlier about degassing and stuff if you don't have a degasser what would you say the best thing you do is pour from high up so you get a nice thin stream and then yes help break yeah the and that's something that that requires some practice also yeah because oh, you're six feet above your you little know, pull hole if you you can't can't eyeball it and he's like, missed it by four inches yeah <laughs> yeah poured it right out onto the floor yeah I was close to the mold, but <laughs> close doesn't count. No. And then also, if you've measured, you know, to try and be economical, you've measured what you believe to be the exact right amount of silicone. You know, if you've got half a kilo all over the place trying to find the poor hole because your estimate was off with regards to <laughs> like, because you haven't got bomb sites on that thing. So, you know, you're trying yeah. to trying to, 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 to zero well, that in. Uh what I do is I'll I'll start pouring, you know, just a teensy bit so I've got a thin stream fairly close to the mold, and then I will raise the container. Once I've already got some in there, then then it's easier to keep it keep the bomb site on track. Quite right. I like that. It's a good analogy. <laughs> um it's probably worth mentioning as well aren't necessarily from the pouring process or from the material itself it can be something that is caused by something like heat for example uh if you've used um like a thick gel coat uh, particularly with polyester this is if you use a thick gel coat and it kind of gets hot when it gets quite thick some people over catalyze <clears throat> and so what can happen is the gel coat can get hot enough that it kind of expands which means there's movement which if something expands but the whole thing doesn't expand at the same rate mm-hmm. you'll end up with a ripple so the the gel coat effectively lifts away from the surface and then sets like that that'll happen oh, with okay. epoxy and with urethane resins too and the thick and the thicker yeah the thicker it is yeah. the hotter and it'll i guess get. 
your release Fast. agents can be a factor in that as well. If something's too well released, then the gel coat can't really grip to it. So you want to release, but without it being slippery. Uh, mm-hmm. So that can be a thing. Yeah, and it can just kind of ripple up and you end up... And I've seen it a lot with people who, who are using... Particularly polyesters, I think, is more prone to, to, to being a pain in the ass because of this. Because of, especially if you're if your mold, so you might have sculpted something in plastiline, so it's oil based, but your edge, your wall, is going to be in water based clay. So it's got water in it and mm-hmm. it's colder. So when you're gel coating with polyester, uh, you want to gel coat correct. You want you want to catalyze correctly for the sculpt, which is you know uh, an oil clay. So it, the, there's no water in that, but there is water in your wall. So you're going onto two different materials with the same gel coat. One little thing I have done in the past is I will gel coat the model itself, the sculpt that's in oil clay. Then I'll add a little bit extra catalyst, mix that into the same, you know, whatever's remaining in the bowl, and then gel coat gel coat the, the wall separately. Yeah. Uh, so it's the same mix, but one is more catalyzed than the other. And then that way you don't over catalyze what's on the mold, it's on, on, on the sculpt. So you get a nice slower. Because otherwise what I've seen is, Basically, if you put the gel coat on, you'll, right. you'll find it has set that makes sense. beautifully and it's ready for glassing on the sculpt. But the gel coat that's the same gel coat that's on the clay is tacky or slimy because it's sitting against something that's got that's wet. Even if you seal it so the moisture isn't actually affecting it, the fact that there's mm-hmm. water in it makes it colder and that slows it down. So, uh, yeah, doing that kind of two step thing. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass. But uh, I, I still love fiberglass. <laughs> Well, if it was if it was yeah, if it was easy, anybody could do it. <laughs> but it's one of those things that I I, I like it. I've, I've 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 used polyester for so long. I'm, I'm quite comfortable with it. But but uh, I have seen that happen, and it's one of those things where people try and mitigate it by putting like fifty layers of wax on, and then it's so waxy that the gel coat just doesn't stick. So you end up sort of talking it as well. Brian Best was very good with that. He was yeah. you know, a master at making good fiberglass molds quickly and, and and doing things like that and he'd heat up the gel coat with a hairdryer first so that it was a little bit runnier and warmer so that you didn't need to catalyze it as much stuff like yeah. that really little things and he'd make notes of everything so i learned a lot from him well brian's in that handful of mold makers who are you know in the in the class uh, with yeah with rob friedis and carl lyon and uh and Gunner Ferdinandson, you know out there yeah he just he's, kind of really thinks about things that and when list. things go wrong he really analyzes it and you have to be that kind of person i think it's because that we you, you're learning all these things from the things and he would document stuff as well and that was the most important thing keeping notes taking photographs and keeping keeping a wall of shame of all the things mm-hmm. that have gone wrong so you can show somebody else so you can say why has this happened um because it's very telling uh, for somebody else and that's how you learn isn't it by, by logging all these things so that's cool um with the, with filling molds uh, yep. with like um say you're filling an appliance mold often i'll put you know, there'll be an injection point in the back. If it's a really big mold, there might be more than one injection point so that you're not filling it from one central point. Um, but I will often use like a, a, a piece of uh, right. like waste water tubing, you know, like the plastic, you know, tubing you'd use in a sink that the water runs out of. It's normally about, yeah, about inch and three yeah, quarters the P- inside PVC diameter, something pipe. like that. And then I'll make I'll yeah. make that fit into the back of the core uh, and make it you know long enough to fill. And then what I will do is I don't really syringe it in. I just leave the weight of the material to flood through. And then I'll make a plunger for it. And if it starts to not quite fill and the silicon is thickening, and I know it's not going to fill... Then I'll, I'll I'll go in with the plunger just to kind of give it that last little bit. But I'll try and fill it with just gravity rather than just you know automatically use a plunger because I think yeah the only stuff that I I use a, a syringe for these days is foam latex. Yes, because that ain't going to flow in by itself. And I you know and I and I've got these uh, I've made these big so you've seen them like these big mm-hmm. syringes that are you know four inches around two and in, two feet long. Yeah. And I've got I've got a few of them for when I do big cowl pieces for yeah. like Shrek or Toxic Avenger, uh, and I'll have multiple injection points for those too. So there's something quite nice about sy- uh, syringing in foam though, because there's air in the foam, <clears throat> it kind of compresses a bit. With silicone, it's it's completely mm-hmm. um, 
pneumatic. There's no there's no give. <laughs> with foam, you can press hard, and then you know there's a little <laughs> bit of give to it. But with silicone, yeah. it's, it's quite fierce. So it's really important that when you're trying to fill it, that you I've kind of slightly deviated from air bubbles here, but it's very important that you don't have like a too small an injection hole because a lot of people make the tube big, but then they'll have like a six mil quarter of an inch hole, and then yeah. that's the bottleneck. So all that pressure can't get through that hole quick enough so you're better off drilling six or seven quarter inch holes and each one of those is then a small little nipple that you can just snip off rather than having one big you know fuck off great big hole that uh you if you're snipping the that off later you might end up yep. cutting through the silicone um and that's no good so i'll put some pictures of that in the in the, in the show notes yep. too but yeah so we'll have to call this episode bubbles and stuff there we go bubbles and stuff <laughs> hey i was thinking the uh, the other thing is i was just going to mention about plunger i make a plunger in advance using that same tubing so i'll just cut a small section of tubing wax the inside make you know get a piece of wood stick it in there flood it with a bit of fast cast silicone uh, fast cast resin uh, let that set overnight pop it out sand it back a little bit there's my custom plunger. But what you can do if you're in a real hurry and it works just as well is to um, use a glove and a piece of sponge. Stick the sponge in the glove and then just whack that in the end and then just use any old stick or a screwdriver to push oh. that down. And that acts because yeah. it creates a gasket seal and it just gives yeah, you enough that's a good pressure. Idea. So if you're in a real fix, you haven't made a plunger in advance. Um, you can just use I've, uh, like for the For my foam plungers, I 3D printed... Uh, for the small ones, I've got like these little... Uh, RC airplane wheels mm -hmm. made out of rubber that that work create a nice gasket seal. But for the the big syringes that are you know the four inches and and, and above, I 3D print the quote unquote air airplane wheel and then I'll mold that in silicone and I'll create I get big washers for those and then I use the same PVC pipe that you use to create my plunger and it gets a gets a great seal for the, for the yeah because you could pushes right down you, to yeah you could just tighten them up and that would squash the wheel wouldn't it making it a little bit squash the, squash the wheel making it a little bit so you can loosen it or tighten it and you know see what gives you the the best seal because you the last thing you want to have happen when you're plunging your your material into the mold is have the the gasket seal too loose and rather than going into the mold it, it just face. pushes right past yeah, yeah, on yeah. the other on the other side of the wheel and you've it's now all on the wrong side of the plunger yeah that's upsetting <laughs> yeah that is upsetting yeah I'm, I'm, it's giving me the uh flashbacks to my my foam latex you know i know i'm gonna have nightmares tonight <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i i remember once one time uh it was my first job as a as a foam runner and i had this mold and i was really excited about it and i put it together and i ran a hobart mix you know the hobart mixes the the big yeah you know about 20 24 inch wide tub you know huge industrial food mixer and so i mixed up this thing and i got the syringe ready i think the syringe was about four feet long and i was about to pour it up you know you've got to stand up we had like a set of steps you'd have to hold this thing above your head tip it in and i put the <laughs> you know the plunger head on and then push down got the air out poof, this little plop of foam comes out turn the thing upside down and then suddenly realize i haven't put a fucking injection tube in the mold <laughs> <laughs> And this thing, Yoink. this thing was already with a gel. So I remember having to kind of uh, wait until the boss had gone, and I surreptitiously put this fucking great big mix of foam in the skip <laughs> because, uh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Lesson learned. Whoops. Uh, yeah. So these things happen. And you were talking about pressure. I'm trying to think. I think it was on the second, no, the first mummy, not the god awful Tom Cruise thing. I didn't work on that one, but the the Brendan Fraser one. And it was being done at Shepparton. And in the foam room, I think it was Keith Wilson and somebody else was running foam. And somebody, some trainee was helping out. I can't think who it was. And they were filling a mold. And I think we were using black foam latex. So we pigmented it black. Yeah. And then it was going to be like dry brushed, you know, with browns and yellows and stuff. To, so the deeper areas would be the, the color of the foam. And uh, there was some kind of, incident. you know, these molds, you got like a syringe that's about six foot long to fill this whole body mold. And it did have a single injection point, I think. So you have to put a lot of pressure on it. So you'd wedge the body mold in the corner of the room, find the sweet spot, and then two of you would lean on the syringe. And I think someone was helping out, and one of the syringes broke or something on the And the pressure of all that foam jetted back towards her. And Ooh. she got absolutely smothered in this black, and it went in her hair and everything. It's like, oh, my God. 
It's horrendous because you, there's nothing you can do about that. Once it's on you, you all you can do is suffer it and peel it out. It was just one of those yeah. things. And uh, shave your head. Yeah, it was it was horrendous. But yeah, Yikes. there's nothing like a <laughs> the the seat the roof. Whenever you go into a phone room, look up to the ceiling because that's the first where you'll see. <laughs> that's where you'll see evidence because it's sometimes it's easy to get that stuff up there, but you can't get up there to clean it up. Well, you don't want to. It's very funny. Uh, yeah, it's very well, well we insulated. Could, God, we could do a whole we could do a whole episode on uh, shop disasters. That would be a really fun episode, actually. Maybe we should put a call out. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe don't name names or places, but maybe uh, write in with some stories of your of your hilarious. <laughs> like if someone like you know gets their face cut off, that's not funny. But like no, uh, you know something that was genuinely quite funny, I think would be a great story oh good there's one little story i'll tell you this uh jimmy sandys was a a, a mechy guy and he still does animatronics really really funny bloke really nice guy and um he had this really really cool we had these things he would do where he would put like a chocolate like a you know in a wrapper on the floor or on a bench or something low down so you'd have to bend down to pick it up and he had a swanny whistle you know the slide whistles <laughs> <laughs> and he'd wait for someone to come and pick it or a pound coin or something. Yeah. And when people bent down to pick it up, he'd go, hey, uh, very funny. <laughs> just little silly, little, uh, very, very funny. Very, very, just, you know, that sort of stuff. I love that because it, it was like living in a carrot in real life. Do you know what I mean? And for someone to, for that. Oh, so funny. Very funny. Stuff like that. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about things that have gone horribly wrong that are still quite funny. So, yeah. I was teaching a, a makeup effects class at one of the colleges where I where I used to teach. And there was a student who wasn't in the class, but had wanted to be in the class and saw we were, we were doing bald caps before life casting the students. And he thought he would come in and, and help out. And he grabbed some adhesive out of out of one of my kits and helped glue down a bald cap with super glue. Ooh. <laughs> oh God. Uh. Fortunately I had, fortunately I had the, the super, the, the dissolver. Yeah. For the, for the, oh God. Yeah. This I, isopropyl I mirror state's not taking it off. What's up with that? <laughs> like, what? Wow. What, what were you thinking? Yeah. Well, you're just yeah. trying to help. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh, man. Good times. <laughs> I remember once we had this massive. We did. Um, <laughs> we always have. Uh, I think it was on Alexander. And we had uh, a bunch of us in the workshop late. We weren't late. And then a few of us had blank firing guns. This is a long time ago. And uh, we, we, we have like these John Woo yeah. shootouts in the workshop at the end of the day. <laughs> Oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> they were, they were like you just, yeah, someone just charging across the the workshop at you, firing two pistols at once. It's, it's ridiculous. Christ knows what security. <laughs> well, security didn't worry. But it was years before there were things like the cameras and stuff. It was fine. And also, if you hear gunshots in the studio, it's just filming, right? So, who's gonna know? Oh, good times. Yeah. Right. I think. We've uh, we've passed the air bubbles bit. Now we're just talking about shit. So yeah. So if you have any funny stories about workshop disasters that are not actually criminal or you know disastrous that actually resulted in real harm, I think it'd be quite fun to share. Maybe call them in. Call us up on our speak pipe and leave some messages there. Give us a voice message. This this was fun. There we go. It was man. It was cool. All right. I will speak to you soon. Yeah yeah. I'll be here. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Give us a holler. Let us know what you think. Uh, again, you know, you can reach us at stuartandtodd at gmail.com. Leave a message on our not-so-new website, but still new. And leave us a voice message. Battleswithbitsofrubber.com. We'll talk to you soon. Amazing. Cheers, dude. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye.